this is a Billy Collins poem, and the image in the poem is of a snow globe, you know, a snow globe that you turn upside down and have all uh, the flakes flying. This is called Today. If ever there were a spring day so perfect, so uplifted by a warm intermittent breeze that it made you want to throw open all the windows in the house and unlatch the door to the canary's cage, indeed rip the little door from its jam, a day when the cool brick paths and the garden sprouting tulips seemed so etched in sunlight that you felt like taking a hammer to the glass paperweight on the living room end table, releasing the inhabitants from their snow-covered cottage so they could walk out holding hands and squinting into this larger dome of blue and white. Well, today is just that kind of day. We sing of golden mornings. Our hymn is number 44. church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. So be it. Who are all these people? My name is John Gibbons, and I used to work here. And thank you, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. If you are here for the very first time today, welcome if you have been here always. Welcome if you're somewhere in between. Welcome if you're young. Welcome if you're old. Welcome if you're somewhere in between. Welcome if you're gay, or if you're straight, or if you're queer, or if you're bi, or if you're trans, or if you're somewhere in between. Welcome if you are a saint, or if you are a sinner, and welcome if you are somewhere in between. Welcome if you are rich, or if you're poor, or somewhere in between. 
welcome if you're introverted or extroverted or somewhere in between, and I think you get it. Welcome. If you are new, come after the service for conversation in our common room. Fill out a blue connection card to stay in touch with what goes on around here. It is good to be together. There are a variety of announcements in the back of the order of service. Please take a look at those. And in addition, we've been having congregational conversations. And the last of these are coming up. And there is one that still has some availability. And that will be Thursday at 7.15 in the evening at Carlton Willard Village in the auditorium. And it's open to anybody, whether you're from Carlton Willard or not. But it's a way of finding out what's on your mind and helping us figure out what the directions of the church shall be as we go forward. And so with that, I say welcome to everyone. talk about how our church is a house of memory and hope. And so we talk about things like tradition and, and memory and how things from the past are sturdy and keep us going into the present and how we get hopeful about the way that the world can be and how we come together into community to make it so. And so the church keeps up with the times like a windmill. Now the old windmills were wide and sturdy and made of wood and had big wide sails and they turned grain into wheat, into uh, flour. And the new kind of windmills are tall and thin and they are very, very fast and they, uh, they, they create energy. They turn wind into electricity. And, and our church, here we have lots of ways that the old times have kept up with the new. These pews, for example, have been here for some of them, you know, 300 years. And families have sat here for the, all of those years. And some of the hymns in our hymnals have been here even longer than that. We might have changed the words and some of them we kept the same. But we have changed with the times. And just like the windmill that figures out how to care for the earth and to turn all that energy uh, into something useful that's good for everyone, we do that too here at church. So we are a place of memory and hope. And so in honor of what's sturdy and stands, and in honor of the winds of change, looking forward to the future and being a part of all the dreams that may come, we have today a special treat, and this is a windmill cookie, and I have some helpers who are going to help me out by bringing these around to everybody. Windmill cookies are for two things, in honor of the symbol of the windmill that is the Church of Memory and Hope, and also because windmill cookies were apparently John's favorite childhood treat when he was a kid going to coffee hour uh, at his church, and they always had windmill cookies, and so we have that as a way to say, welcome back. John, wherever you are, welcome back. We're so glad you're back. And here's to the house of memory and hope. I would not have gone into ministry without windmill cookies. <laughs> they put me over the edge. So that is wonderful. And so as those are being passed out and shared and as kids and teachers go off to your in gathering. We're going to sing, and our hymn is Rank by Rank, Again We Stand. It's number 358. <laughs>
And I have recently learned that you can figure out what is happening in a service if you follow along in, in this. And it seems that I went right past the canvas moment and with apologies to Christine Dudley Marling, you're up. I thought I was going to get out of it for a minute. <laughs> when Rich Doherty asked me to do this stewardship moment, I was both honored and surprised. What he doesn't know about me is that my husband's nickname for me is O Ye of Little Faith. <laughs> my connection to Unitarian Universalism began as someone of little faith. I always knew where the UU churches were, where I lived in Madison and Denver, but I never went inside. It was here at First Parish and Don Heights Unitarian in Canada that I began to get involved with my hands, head, and ultimately my heart. Through the work of my hands setting up the plant fair, I saw the rock in the cellar that held up this church for over 200 years. It held up those who built it, those who brought it back from the brink, as Sharon McDonald told us, and it held up you and me. I watched countless people carry up all the tables for the plants and carry on the tradition of the plant fair that was the inspiration of Jean Balfour's mother, Betty. When it was time to shore up that foundation where the rock stood and put down a new cellar floor, I lent a hand to clean out the basement. A number of relics were found there, including extra panes of the beautiful amber glass that you see above you. Now, as I sit in the sanctuary, I think about that over 100-year-old irreplaceable glass and all of us and those before us who have watched the light stream through as we listen to the words and the music that touched us. Cleaning out the closet behind you, I heard John Gibbons remark that changing that door to be outward opening was his greatest accomplishment. <laughs> Humble, if not tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> Each of us here could think of dozens of John's greatest accomplishments that wouldn't include that door. <laughs> Weeding the memorial garden that Janet Powers designed and created reminded me of the incredible talents that all of you contribute to this place. One day, setting up a treasure hunt for an RE class, we included a clue for the cemetery markers, the beautiful carved wooden obelisks that were given by our partner church in Abishvalva. I am inspired by the threads that connect us around the world. By the work of my hands, I have come to know and love this church building but it stands as a symbol for the words and deeds of all of you, all of you here who contribute through your heart, your head, and your hands. I have faith that we are a people and there will be people after us who will continue the great work of this church. Thank you. And I wonder if I still earn that nickname, O Ye of Little Faith. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jean Balfour, and I'm one of the Lay's visitors. Now is a time to come up and light a candle of joy or concern. And at the end of the service, I will stay here if somebody would like to light a quiet, silent candle. This last candle is for those thoughts that remain within us. This is another spring poem, this one titled, It Takes Courage to be Crocus-Minded. 
It takes courage to be crocus-minded. Lord, I'd rather wait until June like wise roses when the hazards of winter are safely behind and I'm expected and everything's ready for roses. But crocuses? Highly irregular. Knifing up through hard frozen ground and snow, sticking their necks out because they believe in spring and have something personal and emphatic to say about it. Lord, I am by nature rose-minded. Even when I have studied the situation here and know that there are wrong things that need writing, affirmations that need stating, and I know also that speaking out may offend, for it rocks the boat. Well, I'd rather wait until June, maybe later. Things will work themselves out, and we won't have to make an issue of it. Lord, forgive. Wrongs don't work themselves out. Injustices and inequities and hurts don't just dissolve. Somebody has to stick their neck out. Somebody who cares enough to think through hard ground because they believe and have something personal and emphatic to say about it. Me, Lord? Crocus-minded? Could it be that there are things that need to be said and you want me to say them? I pray for courage. We have good news, and that is that just as of yesterday, we have learned that one of our Unitarian schools in Northeast India has been assigned to us as a partner, and that is a school you can find on the map if you look really hard and find Shillong. It's in Shillong, which is in the state of Meghalaya, way up in northeast India between Bhutan and Bangladesh. And we have been partnered with the Margaret Barr Memorial School. We'll sometime go into the history of who Margaret Barr was. She was an English Unitarian minister. And it is in the neighborhood of La Sao Tun, La Sao Tun in Shillong. And so we are going to be exchanging materials and information and friendship with the people in this school. And today, Kathy Cordes has brought a panel with pictures, and that will be out in the common room after the service. So please take a look at that. And as you know, on the first Sunday of each month, we distribute our undesignated offering with a portion going to this school in Northeast India and a portion going to the United Teen Equality Center, UTEC, in Lowell. Freely, you know, we have received. Freely give. Our offering will now gratefully be received.
My mentor in ministry, Gordon McKeeman, once reflected upon his career with a series of statistics. Meetings attended, 123,412. Meetings where something was accomplished, six. Books recommended to me by parishioners, 4,310. Books I then read, four. Social problems vigorously addressed, 1,906. Social problems resolved, zero. Looking back on the things I told you I would do on sabbatical is similar. I imagined a lot of things and I did a few. I told you that I would go to a comedy club to work on my timing and I never did. Sorry. I vowed to ride my bicycle every day that it was over 50 degrees. <laughs> And I kept that vow and rode my bike maybe twice. Mainly what I have done for the last three months was simply to stop. I shut off that ministerial radar that is constant. I woke up in the morning without anxious thoughts about the day to come. I stayed in sweats most days. And I am so very thankful to have had this opportunity and I look forward to savoring the remainder of my sabbatical at the end of this year starting in October. I am thankful for D. Russell's leadership on the board and as well to Megan and to Brad and Janet and Lisa and Laura to Joan in the office and to all of you for continuing to show up. You have been in good hands and you joined hands together. As for me, since I last spoke from this pulpit in late December, I delivered the eulogy for Gordon McKeeman in Rochester, Minnesota, where it was 40 below zero. And then in January, I made my will and, among other things, remembered first parish in my estate. Hint, hint. And then last week, I attended the annual meeting of the Funeral Consumers Alliance of Eastern Massachusetts. Does it get any better than that? <laughs> and between those mortal bookends, what did I do? I went to church every Sunday. Raise your hand if you can say as much. Sometimes I even played double headers and went to somebody's early service and somebody's later service. Let's see, I can tell you where I've been by reading my checkbook register. First parishes in Brewster, Concord, Groton, Dorchester, West Roxbury, Grace Chapel in Lexington, Boston's King's Chapel, UU churches in Raleigh and Durham, North Carolina, All Souls, Shelter Rock, and the Community Church of New York, the first UCC, United Church of Christ Church in Somerville, the Harvard Humanist Community, and then more UU franchises in East Lexington, Sherburn, Arlington, and Milton. I attended a conference of the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists and a subsequent gathering of international ministers in New York. I toured the UN, met with the High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
and gave myself a good case of plantar fasciitis while pub crawling for 50 blocks on the Upper East Side of New York. I then went to North Carolina and limped through the largest civil rights march since Selma, protesting voter suppression and income inequality and general disregard for the poor. Back in Boston, I emceed the Beacon Benediction, the farewell ceremony at our UUA headquarters at 25 Beacon Street as they prepare to move to new headquarters at 24 Farnsworth Street in Boston's so-called Innovation District. You know, there is a way in which I flunked sabbatical. Every once in a while, I would run into people and they would say, what part of sabbatical do you not understand? And yes, I also went to Transylvania, and pardon me, PETA, but I killed a pig there and butchered it and smoked it and ate it. I was there for the 100th birthday of the man who painted that painting. You can turn your necks around. In that window is a painting that represents the Sermon on the Mount. And the man who painted it, his photograph is there as well. His name is Tibor Erdush. And he painted that painting, and he did the ceramic in the other window. And he turned 100 years old while I was in Koloshvar. I also visited our partner church of Abashfalva, and I delivered one of the huge, heavy, awkward wooden toolboxes that our kids made in Sunday school under the direction of Art Smith in the back pew. And it was one of the more awkward things I ever stuck in my luggage, and it was appreciated. And I brought us back some fresh pear brandy from the still in Abashfalva. I also met with a Hungarian bishop, and I slept at the Unitarian High School, where I was awakened each morning, not by bells, but by this on their PA system. They blast that between class periods and it is kind of civilized. I preached in a village called Kolosh, in English mostly, but some in Hungarian. And at auction in Budapest, I bought an 1834 first edition of a travelogue by a Hungarian Unitarian, a contemporary of de Tocqueville, and I secured the rights to its English translation and have made arrangements for their bilingual republication. At home here, I did my dreaded part of our taxes. I cleaned my sock drawers. I read a couple of novels, and I caught up with friends. I was on a conference call with President Obama and probably thousands of others talking about the ACA. And with maybe 50 others, I had lunch with the Polish ambassador to the United States talking about Ukraine and the Crimea. But more about those churches I attended. I went to places I expected to be good. Their sermons, their hospitality, their music, and most were. With the possible exception of All Souls in New York, where they have paid vocalists and instrumentalists from the Met and the New York Symphony. Our choir, however, has more verve, more spirit, more light in their eyes than any I have heard anywhere else. There is one other UU church I visited, Dorchester, that has a disco ball. But theirs is in their social hall and not in the sanctuary. I've heard a lot of good sermons, but I also observe that sermons tend to stay within 
the boundaries of a congregation's norms. I went to a church, for example, that is most known for its music program. And what should the minister be preaching about? The transforming power of music. An intellectual congregation got an intellectual sermon. A family-centered congregation got a sermon praising its programs for children, youth, and families. They were all good or very good sermons. I'm not being critical. And I, too, stay mostly within the wide bounds of what's acceptable here. But too often, the religion I heard preached was a religion of high or even noble sentiment. Were we to go deeper, I would say that true religion is not about sentiment, but is about commitment. Not sentiment, but commitment. Let me tell you about the most provocative sermon and service I attended. It was at the First United Church of Christ in Somerville. From that experience, I want to suggest some things for us to consider. That church is close to Davis Square, which of course has a vast and diverse mix of ages, races, restaurants, clubs, sexualities, you name it. Because their sanctuary is being renovated, the service was in the basement, in the round. A big pop-up tent was in the middle with chairs all around it. It was a Lenten service. Lent under the tent, they said. They had two services. I went to the early one with about 60 people attending, mostly young, singles as well as families, diverse in sexual orientation maybe, but mostly white students and young professionals. The liturgy was pretty traditional, old blood and sacrifice hymns, prayer, recitation of a creed and a confession. The text was about Jesus at a meal rebuking his hosts, the scribes and the Pharisees. This is in the Gospel of Luke, and Jesus objects to his host's religiosity and attention to forms and formalities and their inattention to deeper matters of the Spirit. The sermon was set in the context of that congregation's desire to widen its welcome to people of other races, classes, and diversities, becoming at least as diverse as its own neighborhood. The sermon was basically about the importance of rebuking, rebuking one's neighbor. The minister was saying that in order for the congregation to accomplish its goals, its members needed to be able to criticize or rebuke themselves or one another for doing things the way they're doing them now. They need to do some things differently. The minister made the point that we who consider ourselves progressive or liberal about many things are really most comfortable when we talk about loving one another, supporting one another, helping one another, and we are made uncomfortable by the notion that we at times may need to criticize ourselves or one another. A major illustration for that sermon happened to be the work of the Restaurant Opportunity Center, ROC. The Restaurant Opportunity Center is called Rock. Rock United is a group that works with and advocates for restaurant employees to receive better treatment by their employers and to increase the minimum wage for tipped employees. I have preached about this here before, and this is also an initiative of the UU Service Committee. The Massachusetts minimum wage for tipped workers, for example, is $2.63 an hour and has remained unchanged for 15 years. Well, the Somerville minister happened to previously have been an organizer for Rock, and he told the story of restaurant servers 
who came to Rock United because they were being deprived of their tips. You know, wage theft is actually a huge problem in the restaurant industry. In the pecking order of restaurants, however, servers tend to be the best treated. They tend to be the lighter skinned. Perhaps they are working their way through school. The rock organizers ask the servers, well, what about the busboys and how about the dishwashers? They are the ones that are at the bottom of the pecking order, the often foreign born and darker skinned ones. But to this, the servers said, oh no, this, this isn't about them. We are just looking out for ourselves, the servers said. To which the rock organizers rebuked the servers and said, if you are just looking out for yourselves, then you go get yourselves a lawyer. We're not working with you. But if you want to make common cause with the busboys and the dishwashers, come back and we'll work together. The servers were rebuked and taken aback, but eventually they reconsidered and after much struggle and a long campaign, indeed they achieved victories by getting out of their comfort zone, working together on behalf of all employees. To risk rebuking one another is a kind of tough love. And of course, to love one's neighbor is a biblical injunction. And you have probably noticed that it is now the basis for a new campaign in Bedford, the Love Your Neighbor campaign in response to the distressing and persistent anti-Semitic incidents that still plague us. Now, I believe in loving one's neighbor. Do you remember that Calvin Coolidge returned home from church and his wife asked, what did the minister preach about? Sin, said Coolidge. Well, what did he say, his wife persisted. He was against it, Coolidge said. Well, I am all in with loving one's neighbor. You'll be relieved to hear. But I think that love sometimes demands that we rebuke one another, repent, amend our ways, get out of our comfort zones, and risk being different. And just because you're perhaps wondering what could Fred Phelps have possibly gotten right, I'm now going to tell you. Phelps and his Westboro Baptist Church, remember, said and did many things that were thoroughly hateful, repugnant, and despicable. He did those things so perfectly horribly that he well may have given the gay rights movement a huge boost because he so clearly identified homophobia with hate. However, outrageous and over the top were his actions, however, he made one assumption that I think is quite true. If I had nobody mad at me, he told the Wichita Eagle newspaper in 2006, what right would I have to claim that I was preaching the gospel? That is, I suggest, a pretty good point. He continued this theme and got a bit rhetorically flamboyant when he told another newspaper, the way to prove you love thy neighbor is to warn them that they're committing sin. You're not going to get nowhere with that slop that God loves you, he added. That is a diabolical lie from hell without biblical warrant. I think Fred got that pretty much right. In his obituary, it was pointed out that before he became a preacher, he was a lawyer, and he won a lot of discrimination suits in civil rights cases. A leader of the NAACP said, most blacks, that's who they went to. 
I don't know if he was cheaper or if he had that stick to itness, but Fred didn't lose many back then. My hunch is that Phelps had not only that stick to itness, but he stuck it to him and that he was just a pit bull of righteous indignation. I come not to praise Fred Phelps, but to bury his and our hatefulness. But I do wish that we could be better at practicing a tougher kind of love. You know, we have that UUA banner hanging on the side of the church. We are standing on the side of love. And when I went to Raleigh for the march, I bought and I wore a bright orange sweatshirt with those same standing on the side of love words. But I also remember our late great minister emeritus, Jack Mendelson. Jack did not curse much, much less than I do. But when Jack heard that new UUA slogan about standing on the side of love, Jack said, that's ball! For Jack, justice is what love looks like in public. I realize that I'm approaching this issue from a lot of angles on a lot of levels, and that's just it. I think that a vital spiritual discipline is to strengthen our ability to rebuke ourselves, to rebuke our neighbor, to engage in self-criticism, first of all, but to warn one another as well, and to get out of our comfort zones so as to approach that transformative place where the magic happens. In the fall, I preached about the Intercultural Developmental Inventory, the IDI, and I did some more work with this instrument while on sabbatical. The IDI, remember, moves from one far end of the spectrum where we assume that our cultural identity is the only cultural identity and, well, why can't other people be more like us? And at the other end of the spectrum, the spectrum we hope to be moving toward, we cultivate an appreciation of cultural differences and we learn increasing skillfulness at intercultural appreciation and adaptation. The tricky thing is that somewhere just past the midpoint on this spectrum, there is a wide place that is called minimization, minimization, where we try to minimize differences and just say that, you know, deep down, we're all the same. And why can't we all just get along? And that wide, loving place of minimization is where a lot of us are most comfortable because it is uncomfortable to genuinely acknowledge and bump up against and struggle with the reality that our differences can be real. In every relationship of one human being to another, difference is real. And being able to encounter difference without being passive or being hostile, without being threatened or being threatening, that ability is one of the most important lifelong learnings in the art of becoming human. A long-standing, sometimes, joke between Sue and me is what happens when, say, I spill the milk. Oh, I say, the milk spilled. <laughs> Sue will say, John, you spilled the milk. She's pretty good at this rebuking thing. Now, I think that milk sometimes spills, and sometimes it's helpful to acknowledge that I spilled the milk, and it is always helpful to speak the truth 
in love. I got into this wanting to tell you about the most provocative sermon I heard while on sabbatical. I took note that most commonly ministers and parishioners and people in general stay in their comfort zones reluctant to criticize, let alone rebuke. In our personal lives, in our congregational life, and in our larger community, I think we would be well served to practice our ability to rebuke one another and ourselves. I do not wish to open the floodgates of destructive criticism or announce an open season on rebuking. I want us to speak the truth in love. As individuals, I do not think that any of us has become all that we can become. There is that old saying that God isn't done with you yet. And well, I don't know about God, but I don't think that you are yet finished with your own becoming. As a congregation, there are things we can do to become more of what we would be. Recall the unintentional humor of the 16th century Polish Unitarians who said, we should not be ashamed if in some way our church should improve. <laughs> and also in our community life, far and near, we still fall short of what Martin Luther King Jr. once called the beloved community. True religion, friends, is really not about sentiment. Religion is about commitment. And so let us renew our commitment to becoming the people we want to be. Bill, let's make sure they're awake. And with that, let us sing a most dissatisfied hymn, Unrest, and we are singing it on these inserted words, even though it is in our hymnal, because the cowardly weasels who edited our hymnal edited out the most central words, cosmic slime. This is your only opportunity to sing a hymn with the words cosmic slime, and let us do so enthusiastically. Oh, 
star to star. Wrongs don't work themselves out. Injustices and inequities and hurts don't just dissolve. Somebody has to stick their neck out. Somebody who cares enough to think through hard ground because they believe and have something personal and emphatic to say about it. Me, Lord? Crocus-minded? Could it be that there are things that need to be said and you want me to say them? I pray for courage. Amen. Thank you.